And so our favorite author, Ian Fleming, set out to write the spy novel to end all spy novels. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at his first novel in the James Bond series, Casino Royale. So it came out in 1953, and in the United States, it was released under the name You Asked For It. I think we all can say that Casino Royale is a much better name. Also, throughout this video, I'm using the Dynamite Comics graphic novel adaptation of Casino Royale, so all the credit goes to them. I'm just talking. Anyway, let's begin. The story starts with Bond already at the Casino Royale, and begins with one of the best, in my opinion, opening lines of any book. The scent and smoke and sweat of a casino are nauseating at 3 in the morning. We are also introduced to Bond, who is hanging out at the Casino Royale, playing roulette, watching Le Chiffre. Then we get a dossier on Le Chiffre, which states how he is a Soviet agent, a member of Smirsch, and is the man in control of a communist trade union in France. We then see a document sent from the head of S to M, in which he lays out the operation for M's consideration. One thing I've seen a lot on the internet is the idea that giving Bond money to gamble against Le Chiffre is a pretty bad idea, and that MI6 should just have arrested him or assassinated him. Well, in the book Casino Royale, it's explained that a simple assassination of Le Chiffre would not be effective because the Soviet government would just make him a martyr. So anyway, Bond meets Mathis, which unlike the 2006 movie, which they meet for the first time, the book Mathis has known Bond for quite some time, since before the war, actually. Mathis, in a humorous bit of impersonation, impersonates a radio salesman in Bond's suite, and then informs him, after turning a radio on to drown out their conversation, that Bond's cover has been blown already, and that two Soviet agents are listening in through the chimney of Bond's room, this is also having to do with something that I hear a lot about, Bond using his real name. Bond is a secret agent and other intelligence agencies have a dossier on Bond, so of course they can figure out who he is. I always hear casual Bond fans talk about how Bond just goes around saying his real name, but if anyone had taken the time to actually watch the movies or read the books, they could see that he does in fact use aliases quite a lot of times. And when he does use his real name, it's because he knows that the people in opposition to him would have already found out who he really is, so he doesn't have to bother with it at all. So Mathis informs him that his partner agent, which in my sixth sent, Vesper Lynn, is here. Upon hearing this, Bond is mad. We see the sexism come out as he thinks, why would they send a woman? Do they think this is a picnic? and girls are for recreation. On assignments, they just complicate matters. Bond is later walking outside when a bomb goes off and two men are blown up. We later figure out that these men were some Bulgarian hoods that the Russians use as hitmen. And one was supposed to throw a bomb at Bond while the other one activates a smoke bomb. The only problem was that the hitman activated the smoke bomb first because they wanted to be extra careful, and this smoke bomb turned out to be an actual bomb that the Russians meant to take care of any loose ends. Bond recovers and gets a massage, and later on meets Felix Leiter for the first time. It is at this meeting with Felix Leiter that Bond orders one of the most memorable drinks of all the franchise, the Vesper Martini, but at this time Bond doesn't even have a name for it. So later on, Bond dines with Vesper, in which he indeed finds his name for his drink, and also tells of the way he got his 00 number, which was killing a Japanese cipher expert in New York City and the Norwegian double agent in Stockholm. We also get quite a lot of how to play Baccarat, but even though this is here to inform the people who are reading the book and might not know how to play Baccarat, it's really never boring or tedious, it's actually pretty interesting. We finally come to the card game. Bond scans every gambler at the table, giving his thoughts about each in his internal monologue. And then we are finally introduced to our villain, Le Chief. The game starts and Bond loses eventually. 
just when Bond has already thought about how the job is a failure and how he will have to face M, he gets an envelope with a note reading, Marshal Aid, a nod to the United States giving Europe aid after World War II and finding 32 million francs, enabling Bond to buy back into the game once again. And of course, this comes from none other than Felix Leiden. But as Bond is looking at this gift and being amazed by it, a man comes from behind him and tells him that he has a cane gun to his back and that if Bond doesn't leave the table, he will blow his back out. So Bond does the thing that any suave, sophisticated secret agent would do. He fakes fainting and falls backwards in his chair, knocking the man over. After this, Bond is back in the game and beats Le Chief, bankrupting him, signing his death warrant. Afterwards, Bond puts the check for his winnings in a brilliant hiding spot and goes to eat with Vesper. During their dinner, Vesper gets a message from a waiter which says that Mathis requires her. When Bond is paying, he realizes that something isn't right and decides to go out and check on her. In doing so, he finds her being kidnapped by a sheaf. Scrambling to his Bentley, he gives chase, and while doing so, curses Vesper for getting herself involved with man's work. It's alarming to read Bond thinking about how if she dies, she dies, and he would just simply go back to his room and go to sleep and wake up and, and act like he has no idea where she went. Unfortunately, Bond's car is disabled by some spikes that Le Chief had placed in the road instead of Vesper laying in the road like in the, in the 2006 adaptation. Bond is pulled out of the car and is taken with Vesper to a villa that Le Chief rents. He is stripped naked and put on a cane chair with the seat cut out. Le Chief then tells him that it is up to him how the session goes and that if he does not divulge information, he will be tortured to the edge of madness. Le Chief tortures Bond with coffee and a carpet beater instead of the knotted rope that was in the movie. It is also pretty interesting how Bond recalls torture resistance tactics that colleagues who had been tortured by the Germans and the Japanese during World War II used. Finally, when Le Chief is getting ready to castrate Bond, a voice is heard. It turns out that an agent of Smirsch has traveled from the Soviet Union to assassinate Le Chief and after asking Le Chief if he pleads guilty, kills Le Chief with a bullet to the head. He then spares Bond simply because he's a man who follows orders and he has no orders to kill Bond. But he does carve a letter into the back of Bond's hand so that Smirsch agents in the future will be able to recognize Bond as a spy. This makes Bond faint and he wakes up two days later in a hospital. Mathis comes to see Bond, and it is revealed that Bond hid the check in the most clever hiding spot anybody could ever think of, behind the number sign of the door to his hotel room. Mathis and Bond have a philosophical conversation about the nature of evil, and Bond toys with the idea of leaving the service. After getting out of the hospital, Bond and Vesper take a vacation together. Vesper acts strangely throughout the vacation, constantly thinking that they are being followed, to which Bond naively refuses to believe, since he just thinks since the job is over, there is no sense of danger anymore. During the vacation, Vesper continuously acts erratically and lies about simple things, but still, for some reason, Bond is set on marrying her. This all comes to an end, however, when Bond finds her dead. After overdosing on sleeping pills, Bond reads the note that Vesper left, detailing how she was a double agent for Smirsch against her will, and that she felt there was no escape for her. It is at this time that Bond decides that he will not resign from the service, and that he will continue to fight the Russian system. The novel ends with the famous quote, Job's done. The bitch is dead. So yeah, that was Casino Royale, the first Bond novel. For being the first novel in the series, it's pretty good. We get introduced to several of Bond's habits that really we don't get to see in just the movie series, such as his 60 cigarettes a day average and his love of his Bentley four and a half liter. Also, we hear about his World War II experience and we see him use a Beretta 25 caliber pocket pistol 
instead of his famous Walther PPK. Bond is also very careful and takes several precautions during the book, such as putting hairs across doors and talcum powder on things to see if anyone had been in his room, and sleeping with a cult police positive under his pillow. Compared to several of the other books, Bond is very much humorless in this book. He's very straight shooting, you know, he doesn't joke about a lot. And he's very sexist in comparison to the other books. As much as I love Mads Mikkelsen's version of Le Chief, I must say, I really like the way the book version of Le Chief is. In the movie, it is explained how he's a mathematical genius and banks the terrorist of the world. But I really don't get that Le Chief is a cold-blooded killer as much as I do in the book. I mean, in the book, he does not care if he has to kill somebody. Whereas in the movie, Le Chief, at least to me, just seems like he's somebody who has got in way over his head and is trying to save his own skin. Vesper is alright, but I honestly don't understand how Bond falls in love with her, for the most part, especially with the way she acts in the last part of the book. I would definitely say Eva Green's character in the 2006 movie is much better than the novel's character. As for Felix Slider, this is a good start for the character, and we're going to see him and Bond develop a much more close relationship in further books. Also, Mathis is featured here quite a bit, and unlike the movie version of Bond, there is no subplot or suspicion of Mathis being a traitor. So, of course, we know that Casino Royale has been adapted into the 2006 movie starring Daniel Craig, but it's also been adapted two other times in the, in the film. One as a television special in 1954, and the other in 1967 as a spoof movie starring David Niven and Peter Sellers. I would definitely recommend reading this book. So anyway, that's all for Casino Royale. Thank you for watching. I've been Jonathan Lynham. Until next time.